All right, can you hear me? Very good. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on one of the biggest challenges uh, we have to healthcare today. So Doug and Ernie did a great job of framing this issue up from the FDA and the economic perspective. I'm gonna talk about the impact on hospitals and health systems and patients. And while tremendous uh, strides have been made, uh, as the graphs all show going down, um, there's still a huge, huge issue. Now, uh, I know this group is specifically looking at disasters versus a new term, classic shortages. I, I hadn't heard that term before, but I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, it's unfortunate they're classics, um, but they, they certainly are. I would challenge this group, though, to understand what I think all pharmacists would tell you is that the unpredictable nature of all drug shortages result in a disaster for our health systems and for our patients. So since 2010, the Cleveland Clinic had hired a full-time drug shortage pharmacist. Now, while Chris is a very nice guy and his kids have to go to college, I wish I didn't have to spend the money to have a full-time drug shortage pharmacist. And while he was, I believe, the first, it's not uncommon for health systems to have to uh, put this kind of resources into managing drug shortages. And for context, when I talk about the Cleveland Clinic, we operate as an enterprise. Most hospitals are part of health systems today, so we standardize a lot of processes and try to uh, help move product around our system. So we have 14 hospitals. 12 of those are in Northeast Ohio. We've got one in Florida, an Alzheimer's Research Center in um, Las Vegas, a hospital in Abu Dhabi, and we're opening one in London. But when you talk about um, drug shortages, you have to talk about the, the supply chain. And Ernie did a great job of kind of framing up the economics, but economics is very important. Healthcare, like every other industry, has to manage inventory. So we, um, like drug manufacturers, don't have a lot of extra capacity. We have a just-in-time inventory for most drugs, and other exceptions for things that we have to keep uh, special. We reorder when, when we get down to a five-day supply, up to seven days, we get shipments every day, and we try to keep our PAR levels there. So that's important when you look as, a, as an enterprise. This year, the Cleveland Clinic will spend a billion dollars on drugs, that's our budget. We have 4,000 individual line items, 4,000 individual products that we have to keep for our patients. Our inventory cost at the main campus alone is $29 million, million dollars and $53 million across the enterprise. Now the advantages of managing this is that you increase efficiency, you decrease a waste because every one of those drugs has an expiration date on it, and unfortunately, uh, the expiration date is not on the barcode, so someone has to manually check those every, every uh, few months. Uh, if you manage this well, you can decrease your inventory and um, decrease the number of outdates that you have. The disadvantages are pretty obvious. We don't have a lot of extra capacity. Disruption in the supply chain leads to a lack of drugs for patients very, very rapidly. So you know, when we talk about shortages, uh, I like the, the definition Ernie gave. If you ask a pharmacist, it's pretty simple. We can't get the drugs in the quantity we need for our patients today. Um, the unexpected drug shortages are extremely difficult to prevent and difficult to predict. It's uh, important for us to have rapid and effective management. Unfortunately, we're really good at that now because drug shortages are so embedded in what we do. We you know, get our SWAT team together and, and, and deal with all the problems, uh, but it is uh, a, very, a very big issue. And the causes of shortage, I'm not gonna go into those. I think they've been uh, said here, you know, whether it's the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the vials or they've got metal shavings in the product or the stoppers, uh, a variety of issues. Now we do try to uh, Get a, get a handle on this by market intelligence. We, we get reports from certain manufacturers, Pfizer, Fresenius, uh, Hikma, Aeromedics, uh, give us resupply dates on drugs that we know are short. Uh, my colleague from Amerisource here, they're our wholesaler, there are only really three big wholesalers. We get a daily unable to supply report. So basically, when we get in those supplies every day, we get a list, we were not able to supply X, Y, and Z. Uh, that happens relatively frequently, and often that is the first time we know that we have a drug shortage or one that's going to start. Sometimes it's simple, we can get a different generic, sometimes it's the beginning of a disaster. So again, 
the causes, uh, a lot's been said about manufacturing, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, and, and all of that. And then we have the, the luxury, uh, I mentioned we have a hospital in Abu Dhabi, so I have colleagues in, in the Middle East, and their supply chain is not as good as ours because of the FDA and the time that they put into ensuring the integrity. There are generic manufacturers in certain parts of the country that my colleagues uh, won't use and, and they, it's very difficult for them to understand. We have luxury of a great uh, FDA oversight, however, uh, it is a very time-intensive process when a company has to start making a drug. They have to, you know, and I talked about capacity, just like we don't have a lot of capacity, and Walmart, any supply chain, doesn't have a lot of capacity. No manufacturer has an idle manufacturing line sitting around saying, gosh, you know, we've got this just in case something goes wrong because we all have to use our resources effectively. So when something happens, you have to get an ANDA. I know the FDA facilitates that, but it's still, when you can't get drugs for patients, it seems like it's taking too long. So I mentioned that it's very difficult to predict and prevent. And uh, predictive analytics, uh, you know, I'd like to see a tool that could show us and anticipate when drug shortage is gonna happen. I haven't seen anything with that. Uh, one of the, the big improvements is uh, FIDASIA, where manufacturers have to tell the FDA if they're going to stop making a product or um, if they're going to have a shortage. Unfortunately, they don't have to tell them why there's a shortage or how long they think it will last. If we could strengthen that, I think that would help tremendously. And while there is some forecasting, you know, the manufacturers look at it, uh, our wholesalers look at it, the FDA looks at it, uh, ASHP does, it's very important for transparency. What the drug manufacturers know, we don't know. We don't know where the active pharmaceutical ingredient is, is uh, made, is, is uh, manufactured. We didn't know until Maria that there were something like 43 manufacturers on a hurricane-prone island. Um, so the lack of redundancy and knowledge of where things are. It took a long time for us to figure out what was going on with that. And then there's compounding, which has been mentioned. Um, now, you know, the, the FDA has 503A and 503B guidance, and uh, I, I know not everyone here is a, a pharmacist uh, or works for the FDA, but uh, we can compound things for our hospital and health system. Often we can get the raw ingredients. For instance, there's a sodium bicarbonate shortage. It's basically baking, uh, baking soda. We didn't actually go to Costco and, and get Arm & Hammer. We ordered it from a manufacturer, but we were able to sterilize uh, uh, that and make it. The problem is the FDA's guidance has a one mile radius for your hospital. We have 12 hospitals uh, within an hour and a half of Cleveland. I can make those for the main campus, but I can't send those to my other 11 hospitals because they're outside of that radius. In a drug shortage situation, these uh, rules should be waived. So what do you do when, um, I, I think someone may have said, when, when, it, when it hits the fan, when, when you know you have a drug shortage? Again, unfortunately, we're really good at it because we get so much practice. But pharmacy generally leads this, and we get together the key stakeholders. Who are the physicians impacted by this drug? Is it a cardiology drug? We get the cardiologist. Is it an oncology drug? We get the, the oncologist. Uh, pharmacists and medication safety officers, sometimes, as with Maria, it impacted nursing practice, as I'll talk about a little bit. Informatics, everyone uses an electronic health record. So anytime we change a drug, that takes tremendous amount of labor for pharmacists, uh, informatics, to go in and change all the order sets. You have this disease, you get this drug, this drug, this drug. So that, that is a huge amount of time. And of course, our supply chain folks who work directly with manufacturers. So we've always got, I, I talked about all those hospitals, we have an enterprise-wide drug shortage call every week. Uh, when Maria hit, we had it daily and sometimes twice a day. And you add people as needed. When we needed to do nursing education, we added nurse educators. So this is a, an example of, of what happens, and I call it the domino effect or cascading effect of a drug shortage. So when Maria hit, we found out that mini bags, which are 50 and 100 cc little uh, bags of diluent, D5 and normal saline, almost every drug gets diluted and a nurse hangs that bag and it drips in the patient and they can walk away and do other things. Well, we couldn't get the bags or the mini bag plus, which has an adapter so you can screw on um, an antibiotic or other drugs. So because Baxter got hit, 
we couldn't get Baxter products, so what's everyone do? You, the competition, um, Hespera made it, so guess what? Hespera can't keep up and they run out. So some drugs that were already added, they had frozen, potassium chloride for instance, came from a manufacturer, it wasn't in Puerto Rico, but people couldn't get bags, so they bought all the frozen. Guess what, we ran out of frozens. And because we couldn't get the piggybacks that we usually hang, we said, okay, nurses can push in a syringe uh, into patients. Now, it takes more nursing labor and, and takes more time, but guess what? You have to have a syringe pump so the nurse can put the pump in there and walk away. We couldn't get enough syringe pumps and the cost would have been prohibitive. So someone on my team said, hey, Scott, you know, we can't get plastic, but we can get glass vials. So we spent a million dollars on glass vials and we had to get separate tubing and put drugs in that. So the, the problem is everyone around the country is doing the same thing. It's very challenging We have this cascading domino effect of one shortage inevitably leads to multiple, multiple shortages. In this case, it was particularly bad because 50 and 100 cc bags you couldn't get. So guess what? Everyone bought 250 cc bags. We ran out of 250 cc bags. Everyone bought 500 cc bags. We ran out of 500 cc bags. Then you have liter bags. Almost every patient who goes to a hospital has a liter bag hanging. We had a pretty significant flu season. Every flu patient is gonna get a bag of saline or something. We were within two weeks supply at the Cleveland Clinic of not having saline. Now obviously we didn't get that low, but we were very, very scared that was gonna happen. And that happened across the country. So the response to drug shortages, you have to manage your inventory, uh, collaborate when you can with manufacturers, and some manufacturers are better than others with being open and trying to tell you what they can. You know, they're obviously worried about being sued as well, so they're, you know, they don't give you as much information as they could. Optimize your compounding processes. Uh, you know, there is the ability to use 503B manufacturers. However, guess what? You think 503B manufacturers have a lot of extra capacity just in case there's a hurricane? No, they're making as much stuff as they can for their patients. If they're going to stop, if they're going to start making more of something, they have to stop making something, and that's going to cause another shortage. And if you rely on a 503B manufacturer, so does everybody else is going to try to get it, so they're not going to help you. I'm attempting to create a 503B at the Cleveland Clinic. I just got my numbers in. It's going to cost $8 million. So it's an extremely expensive thing that many small hospitals just can't do. So, what can we do from a regulatory perspective? Certainly, uh, the FDA has done a lot, but anything we can do to facilitate entry into the marketplace. Again, uh, how do we incent folks to enter the marketplace uh, when there's no extra capacity? Um, allow importation, which they've done, uh, of drugs. I think the first time they did that um, was with propofol, uh, and then they, they did it earlier with saline, and while I'm sure at the FDA it seems like they're doing lightning speed, when you're worried about running out of saline, it seems like it takes a long time to get those channels open. Uh, but it was fantastic that we were able to do that. We absolutely have to increase the transparency uh, and phidasia, uh, but also where active pharmaceutical ingredients are made. The manufacturers do not have to tell you that, so if there's an earthquake, we, we don't know until it's too late. And I would say help us uh, in shortage situations, allow 503As to supply for their wholly owned healthcare systems. So with that, there's some uh, key takeaways. The first one is all shortages are a disaster for hospitals, health systems, and patients. So I understand we're looking at just disasters, but they're all disasters. Uh, they have practice-changing impacts on hospitals. The causes vary from difficulties manufacturing to stringent regulation, which we need, but also uh, is an impediment when something happens, consolidation of manufacturers and imbalances in the marketplace. So the response requires a strategic approach uh, from health systems and from the government. Thank you very much.